telepathic power-hungry groups, but it seems fair to say that eventually they all reach the impenetrable barrier of banking. Because when everything in the world is determined by green paper, the true king is the green paper printer. And while we have examined the structure of fractional reserve banking before, today we're going to take a deeper look at the family at the heart of this debt-based debacle, those nefarious Rothschilds. And with us to help facilitate that journey is a man known as Magnora7. I found Mr. Magnora through my love of Reddit, where several times I'd find myself reading an interesting post, check the author name, and sure enough, it usually belongs to our mystery man here. And he's written some great, detailed, well-sourced posts that contain elements of the Rothschild Empire that I never knew about. So I asked him to come here and share that information, and thankfully he agreed. So let's do the damn thing from a deep, dark hole somewhere in the digital ether in his first public interview, my man, Magnora7. Welcome to the higher side. Hi, Greg. Thanks a lot for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah, man. I I'm super psyched. I think this gets back to basics in a lot of ways, but it also is going to add some new information that I think is well worth focusing on. And uh, we plan to start with a good fact-based history of the Rothschilds to give us the proper context for some of the things you bring to the table that I haven't heard before. So let's lay that base. Where do you like to start the Rothschild story? Well, okay, let's go back to the very first Rothschild. So that's Mayor Amschel Rothschild. He was born in uh, 1743, lived to 1812. So his dad was uh, just a trader in Germany, no big deal. But Mayor Amschel Rothschild got a job with Oppenheimer, you might have heard of, hmm. uh, trading coins internationally for kings. And he started doing this, and he got very good at it. And then he got to the point where he evolved the business to take on more of a central banking role. And wealthy lenders had loaned to kings before, but it was usually as a kind of a one-off, you know, here's a loan, once it's paid off, then we're good. But Mayor Amschel Rothschild had the idea of doing a fixed central bank that was a part of the government. So the government would hand over the money creation ability to the central banks. And that was the key. They gave themselves the permanent legal ability to control the money. And that was the beginning of the central banking game. So from Mayor Amschel Rothschild then, he had five children. And they're very religious, and um, part of the Old Testament or the Torah says that you want to use your children like an arrow out of your quiver. So he had five children, and he sent each child to a different country. These are the, the very famous five children of Rothschild. So Nathan went to London, Amschel went to Frankfurt, Solomon went to Vienna, Carl went to Naples, and James went to Paris. The uh, Vienna and Naples branches ended up kind of dying out. They didn't do so well. They gave out some loans, and then they ended up not getting repaid, and they got kicked out of the country, and they had to shut down the, the branch. But the Paris and uh, London branches became extremely, extremely successful. So the London branch, uh, his son Nathan, started this up in about 1820s, 1830s, and same with all the others. They approached these kings and queens of these big countries and basically said, hey, you guys need money? And they, you know, usually in the middle of a war or something like this, and they'd, they'd be like, yeah, we need money. So the Rothschilds have, with their substantial wealth, they would lend to the kings, and then the kings would owe money back at interest, of course. And um, by constantly accruing more and more debt with interest, um, eventually many governments get themselves into a position where they cannot pay back the debt. It's simply impossible. This kind of is how the modern debt-based system came to be, where money is created through debt, so there's always more debt than there is money. Right. So money is simply unrepayable, even from a mathematical perspective, just theoretically, because every dollar that's created accrues interest immediately. So it's through this mechanism, basically, that going all the way back to the 1820s, 1830s, that they started having control of these governments. So it basically turns it so the government has to talk to the debt collector to try and uh, negotiate terms, which gives them control over the government, essentially. Mm -hmm. But anyways, following the uh, French branch, which is very popular, and then the London branch, the banking lineage from uh, London continues to this very day. Evelyn Rothschild was recently knighted by the uh, UK government. The Queen said that Evelyn Rothschild was, quote, the financial advisor to the crown. Mm. Their company, NM Sons and Rothschilds, have commonly traded with the UK, and this is how they got their start. And then it eventually transitioned into 
a sort of ownership situation. So that's basically the, the five minute in a nutshell, <laughs> catch up to where we are today, uh, Rothschild story. Man, I think that's great. And I also just wanted to reiterate, maybe the, the British arm, I guess, is the most popular, but I mean, this British arm of the Rothschild squid, it's still intact as far as you can tell, right? Because a lot of people, they feel this stuff is true, but it's old news and that these banks are now all in the hands of large boards and tangled conglomerates. But there is still a Rothschild at the head of the bank today, right? Like you said. Right, exactly. I mean, it was, uh, I think it was in the 90s that the Queen knighted Evelyn Rothschild as to award him for being a longtime financial uh, support for the crown. So, yeah, this is very, I mean, this goes into the 90s at least, and it still continues to this day. I mean, they're still having meetings. If you look at really high up meetings with the crown, the Rothschilds are always present. There's this real famous picture of one of the Rothschilds pointing at uh, Prince Edward, I think it is, right in the chest. Huh. This, this was 10 years ago, walking up to him, pointing him in the chest, looking down at him. Uh, I've never seen the prince, you know, look afraid of someone, <laughs> but in this picture, it's it's pretty obvious. Yeah, it goes definitely goes right up into this day. Right on. And I guess the natural question would be, why do so many governments just allow themselves to get raped like this? I mean, clearly, if we know, other powerful people have to know. And if the American government can look across the ocean and see how this has happened to many other countries, what incentive is there for even our elite to to let this happen? Because as hungry for power as they are, they're uh, obviously on a second tier. Right. Uh, and it's it seems bad to get into this trap which it is. But the thing is, there's a short term benefit. So the governments, usually they're hard up for money and they need kind of a short term boost of liquidity to keep their country going. And that mm -hmm. that boost is what they seek and they get that and it does help. But then, you know, you wind up five years later down the road and then you can't recover the interest that is required. It's just like someone who buys a house that they can't quite afford and they take out a mortgage that's bigger than they can pay for. They get the house up front, but then a few years down the line, you know, it all comes due and they can't pay. And uh, that's when things go bad. The temptation is strong, I guess. So I also wanted to ask you, the Rothschilds changed their name to Bauer, right? I mean, before this saga started, that Rothschild wasn't their original name, as, as I understand it. Is that what your research shows, too? I've actually, I've never heard that before, actually. Um, really? I have, I, I think they've always retained the name Rothschild from what I've seen, but... Um, you said they changed it? Yeah. A lot of researchers that I've read have talked about the original name being Bauer and that they changed it, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe Bauer was uh, getting a bad rap and so they wanted to just change their name and they changed it to Rothschild because he was putting a red shield on his door or something. It gets weird. Yeah. The, the original Rothschild house had a red sign out front back in the 1550s they didn't identify houses by numbers they identified them by symbols mm. and the rothschild house had a red sign out front and so that did become the rothschild that means red shield basically so that that's where that came from so it yeah it might be true that they changed their name at some point but i don't think they really had power until uh, Mayor Amschel came along and worked for Oppenheimer. Sure. And that that's really where the big money came in, and that's where the, the empire started. You know, it's like keeping the beach ball in the air. It, <laughs> it got passed from Oppenheimer to Rothschild is how I view it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And you mentioned that the Italian Naples branch ended up shutting down. And when I was reading what you wrote about that, you mentioned that leading up to it, it seemed like the other brothers were refusing him loans and that kind of stuff. I wondered why, why they uh, seemed to kind of shut him out a little bit. Was it just poor decision making on his part? So they had to cut the tie. Yeah, I think there was part of that. And I think it was just financially insolvent. The government in Naples wasn't working well with the Rothschilds. And there was kind of like a Italian mafia that was butting heads with the Rothschilds a lot in Italy is my understanding. Mm. And uh, also Carl, the one who went to Naples, had seven daughters and no sons. So there was no, from the Rothschild perspective, no way to continue the lineage through him. So that may have played into it as well. Hmm. And one other point about this particular branch, to quote what you say, 
about the Italian branch and Brother Kalman, who was the, the brother in charge of this one, you say he had five children, one of whom was to a woman named Charlotte, who married Lionel from the British branch, her first cousin. The Rothschilds take lineage very seriously, and the practice of marrying within specific ethnic groups, class, or social statuses, rejecting others based on being unsuitable for marriage for all these basis. And, uh, you know, basically that they inbreed because they consider their bloodline superior. And I wondered what else could be said about that. There are claims that range from they want to preserve this German Jewish heritage to full blown reptilians. I mean, what are your thoughts on the details of the Rothschild bloodline and why they do what they do? I mean, and it's not just them, too. We got Carnegie's. Right. All these big families. Is it just racism and superstition or do you think it goes deeper? No, I think it's a I think it's a preservation thing. I think it's a cuz there's this evidence of look, we're so clever. We figured out this game that no one else has figured out. We're literally trillionaires. So who can compare to us? So we must have something special. And you know, everybody thinks they're smart, but if you have proof of it in the form of you having a trillion dollars, it seems <laughs> it's a little more convincing. So, I'm sure these families just convince themselves that they've got the special genes that allow them to be able to comprehend and do this, whereas I'm sure actually lots of people could do it. They just happen to be in the position. And I think that preservation is what it's all about. But I mean, it just like you said, lots of people have done it. I mean, there's been kings and queens throughout Europe's history that have done this. And it's always caused problems, right? The inbreeding causes all these mutations and uh, weaknesses and illnesses. Uh, that end up killing a lot of them uh, in the long run. But, right. you know, so in that way, it's a disadvantage. So it's I, I would say the only advantage they're really getting from it is this idea that they're preserving something that's special to their bloodline, which I think they think is their intelligence. <laughs> Fair enough. So obviously the Rothschilds are controlling a lot of countries through the central banking. They got the British Empire. They control the French Empire as well. Right. They control the Austrian Empire, all these major areas. Now, we were going to get into some of the details. I think probably this is where we're at of what happened in parts of Africa. And this is like so interesting to me and, and kind of what spawned us getting together for this. But tell us about these aspects. Yeah, so I started, you know, a big part of this conspiracy is that some people say the Rothschilds own all of the central banks except Syria, uh, Iran, Cuba, North Korea. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of theories floating around that, that they own literally every world bank except for those those ones. So my take on it is if that is true, then I should be able to pick any country at random and research it fully and be able to find evidence that the Rothschilds own it. <laughs> so I chose Zimbabwe was the first one. I just kind of put my finger on a map and looked at it. Wow. So looking at Zimbabwe, I noticed something interesting. Uh, it's just to the northeast of South Africa. It shares the border with South Africa, which the British also controlled. So in Zimbabwe, uh, what they wanted to do, basically Cecil Rhodes and Baron Nathan de Rothschild worked together with the Queen who uh, signed off on this, who's also being backed by this NM Rothschild and Sons Bank. 1888, Cecil Rhodes and Nathan Rothschild formed De Beers Company. 1889, they formed the British South Africa Company in South Africa. And then in 1890, one year later, they invade with troops from the British South Africa Company into Zimbabwe. So they wasted no time between getting the you know Queen's approval, the Royal Crown approval, Rothschild approval, and then they started marching troops up through South Africa in 1890 to take over Zimbabwe. And basically what they did is they just marched in and just took over tons of land immediately. They had the, the Maxim gun, which was a very powerful weapon. It was one of the first fully automatic machine guns, which is a big part of the technology that allowed uh, not only England, but other countries to conquer Africa, the scramble for Africa. The Maxim gun played a pivotal role in that. So by 1890, the British South Africa troops had, or police as they called them in the, the language, they invaded Zimbabwe and started taking over different sections of Zimbabwe. By 1986, six years later, there's 4,000 BSAC police in Zimbabwe. 
So the Zimbabweans are starting, the locals are starting to get upset with this, of course, because they're just grabbing territory and they're starting to take over governments. So the Zimbabweans revolted. They managed to kill 400 BSAC troops, but over 50,000 native Zimbabweans died in this war. It's 125 to 1 ratio. Wow. Which is almost certainly because of the Maxim gun. The British said at the time, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. So after killing 50,000, they then ruled Rhodesia, they called it, until uh, 1922, which they called it Rhodesia because of Cecil Rhodes, which is also the Rhodes Scholar Program that Bill Clinton and many other politicians have done. But the BSAC had uh, Rhodesia until 1922, and then they turned it over to the British Crown. And, you know, like we talked about, the Rothschilds have a lot of control of the British crown and the Rothschilds directly funded the BSAC. So it's pretty clear to see that there's a handoff of territory. Uh, The BSAC was shut down because, you know, very unpopular. It was turned over to the crown, which is similar to what happened in India. If you think about it, you know, the British East India Company had control of India for 100 years before they gave up control and gave it to the crown, who then had it for another 100 years. Mm -hmm. Anyways, Zimbabwe. So. British ruled Zimbabwe then after 1922 when the BSAC was gone. Uh, and Zimbabwe started again with another revolution in 1964, which lasted until 1979. And in this one, Robert Mugabe, who's the current president, was spearheading the military effort to uh, get rid of the white local minorities within Zimbabwe, basically. They managed to kill 1,300 Rhodesian security forces, which are basically you know British or Rothschild troops. And which resulted in the deaths of another 10,000 Zimbabwean guerrilla fighters. So between this, there's two rebellions, 60,000 Zimbabweans died, and maybe 1,700 total foreign forces died. And this resulted in Zimbabwe getting independence in 1979, which it was the last country in Africa to get independence from the British crown. It came in a surprise move, uh, was announced by the British crown completely unexpectedly because they weren't losing the war, but it became obvious that from a PR perspective, it looked really bad to have, (laughs) you know, just this one colony owned by the British empire. Right. Just left on the map. So they've, they've granted independence to every country, which puts us in this era of neo-colonialism where you can't tell, you know, who's pillaging who everybody gets their own name and you can't see what's going on behind the doors. Right. So, uh, Zimbabwe, when they got independence in 1979, there was a big conference in England, and this is where they were given control over their own country, supposedly. But in reality, the debt was maintained. The Zimbabwean government is still in debt to the Zimbabwean Central Bank, which is almost certainly set up and owned by the same people who you know, ran the empire, which is the Rothschilds. So... It's pretty clear even to this day that Zimbabwe is controlled by the Rothschilds. But, you know, it's not a complete and total control, but it's it's pretty close. And it's been loosening as the Zimbabweans fight back and trying to regain control of their country. But there's just so many layers and subtlety to the control that they can strip off the obvious layers like the name or, you know, who's running the government. But at the end of the day, the debt is still controlled by the Rothschilds and the money creation ability is still owned by the British crown. Mm-hmm. Man, I, this isn't super, I guess, surprising to a person who's looked at conspiracy for a long time, but the details are just so interesting. And you really can take the story from the formation of Rhodesia or Zimbabwe all the way to, to current day, because like you said, it got its independence in 1979, 1980, but that that was largely kind of just for show. And since its independence, they've only had one president. So it's very easy to see that this is obviously uh, some type of puppet president and that the control is still there. Right, exactly. Robert Mugabe has been the only president since 1980. I mean, they've got the guy they like in power. And so, you know, there's not fully democratic elections happening. Yeah, it's still controlled, but they've improved the appearance, the facade. Man, it's just the the influence of a handful of people on a planet of billions is always staggering to me. You just have 
the Queen of England, write a charter funded by the Rothschilds, create a company creatively named British South African Company. Right. Sounds very official, right? Right. And you just have uh, basically they have a private corporate military. And this is in the 1800s. And this also isn't the first time, like you mentioned, the British East India Trading Company controlled India really in the same way. And it's just so weird to think about corporations in this way or to take them back that far and just right. see the the template reapplied so many times. Yeah, and you know the Dutch East India Company is another example. Yeah, it's really startling when you kind of step back and look at corporations and governments objectively right next to each other because there are a lot of corporations that are more powerful than countries and we think of countries as being the most powerful entity usually, you know. Mhm nothing's bigger than a nation right and so when we think of it from that perspective companies are a subset of nations but i mean when you really look at it it's the other way around nations are a subset of companies and nations exist to let companies do you know their operations more easily in a lot of cases especially in these poor countries that are just conquered by other countries basically Mm -hmm. well said And it's so convenient, too, that, you know, they can conquer another country like Zimbabwe and then say, oh, the British wanted this. The crown wanted this. They they ordered it. You know, it's their troops. Right. So they have this level of distance, this plausible deniability that they can throw in there that gives them this layer of separation that, you know, they can wash their hands clean and walk away, which is kind of what lets them keep getting away from it because they can just wear all these different masks of, oh, you know, now I'm the British government or now I'm the French government and then do all these actions that profit them and then, pin on, you know, make the government who did it look bad instead of the Rothschild. So there's always this layer of deflection. Right. Not unlike what happens with the private military contractors in Iraq, like Blackwater and that kind of stuff. Exactly. And Halliburton. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. We pull out of Iraq and then there's still 70,000 mercenaries that the U.S. has for hired there. But we say we pulled out, you know, the U.S. has pulled out of Iraq, but that's garbage because we're paying people to fight there still. Tens of thousands of people. Right. And it's just so funny because people today in the conspiracy world are so paranoid about private U.N. troops, about seeing people with U.N. logos in the Carolinas or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, obviously that's concerning, but they have literally been doing this for centuries. And you just, I guess they don't know that part of the history or they think this is some new concept that once they've done this, we're really screwed. Well, just look at history. This isn't new. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But so to move the story along, also, we were going to talk about Botswana, right next to Zimbabwe, just west of it. And this is where you mentioned the De Beers Company has maintained operations for 130 years that Cecil Rhodes and Nathan de Rothschild started De Beers in 1888, just one year before they created that British South African company. Uh, what more can be said about De Beers and the Botswana saga? Well, De Beers is a very interesting company because it's it's Rothschild owned even up to this day. The recent CEOs have been Rothschilds. I mean, just as recent as 10 or 20 years ago. But De Beers is also very interesting because they basically created a world monopoly on diamonds. A lot of people, this is starting to become common knowledge that De Beers owns like 90% of the world's diamonds. You know, it used to be not commonly known. Now it's it's pretty well known. It's getting there. But with owning 90% of the world's diamonds, uh, which they mine mostly in Botswana, they can then determine the the price of the diamond market by determining how many diamonds they let out of supply. So they may only sell like 10% of what they actually mine that year just to drive the price up artificially high, which they've done and continue to do. And the use of diamonds and engagement rings is something that didn't exist really as a common meme until the 1940s <laughs> and that came about through De Beers advertising through media created by De Beers that created basically a cultural institution that makes people spend tens of thousands of dollars on a rock that's artificially <laughs> inflated that they got by taking over Botswana. Man, don't I know it. So knowing all that, it's hard to you know <laughs> want to buy a diamond ring. Uh huh. But looking more at Botswana, um, 62% of Botswana's exports are diamonds. 
So you can see with 62% of their export market being determined completely by one industry that's owned by the Rothschilds, they can very easily control the country. So they can, for instance, if the government has a shortage or the economy is doing poorly, they can make that swing one way or the other, depending on how nice the government of Botswana is, is being towards the Rothschild. So that, unlike the Zimbabwe one where they just marched in with guns and, you know, just basically took over the government, in Botswana, they did something kind of similar, but they took over the economy. They built an economy that basically makes the existing economy obsolete in a lot of ways. So by being a huge player in Botswana, they've given themselves all this power, basically. And this was done, you know, in parallel with the Zimbabwe stuff. So, yeah, it's like you said, 1888 was the Beer's creation. 1889 was the BSAC creation. And the invasion happened right after that. Man, it's just fascinating. And like you said in one of your pieces, we've heard of company towns where everybody in town works at the factory or whatever or the mine. And then when those things dry up, the town has really nothing there to support itself. It's It was so dependent on one particular company. And now we're just scaling that up. We're talking about company nations, entire countries that are basically in existence to prop up one company and one source of revenue for a very select group of people. And it's just super interesting. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's kind of mind boggling to see. And just like those company towns, they'll give you like, a, when you think of the, the kind of archetypical example, you have the mining town in America or something like that, where everyone's paid in company bucks, you know, and then they have to spend the company bucks at the company store. Hmm. So you can't even break out of the company's economy. So you get paid in company bucks, you spend company bucks at the company store. So they've completely <laughs> captured your entire economic behavior basically within the company. So like you said, they've scaled that up now to an entire nation. So not only are they doing the industry that's providing the, the some jobs there for people, also almost certainly providing the economy where the money is spent to. And if they're controlling the money supply in a similar way as they are with many other countries, then it's literally the company bucks scenario again, but on a larger scale and with the veneer of legitimacy because it's spearheaded by a government instead of a company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I love it. And I wanted to also talk about, because we are kind of in that time window of World War II, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what happened to some of these Rothschild branches during that period, because a couple of them were seized, or at least the Austrian branch was seized. And I'm just curious because in the conspiracy world, there's a lot of people who are like, it's the Jews, it's the Jews, it's the Jews. And then there's a lot of people also who talk about it being the Germans. And honestly, when I look at the modern multinational corporations that are the big problem in big pharma and in the food industry, a lot of them are German companies. So it's interesting where this line is drawn, but there was a little bit of conflict between the Rothschilds and the Nazis. And this kind of is a, a big aspect of why World War II happened or why it's framed the way it's framed. What can you tell us about this chapter and kind of untangling this mess? Yeah, that's it's a very difficult, interesting story. To me, this is something that's shrouded in misinformation because the people who did bad things don't want to get caught. You know, the Rothschilds don't want a big trail leading to them. So they're always throwing out distractions, things that you could blame instead of them. So to me, their most common scapegoating technique is to blame the Jews. So because they themselves are Jewish, they want to, instead of saying, you know, the Rothschilds did this, they want to say the Jews did this. Instead of then one family being blamed, there's, you know, millions and millions of people being blamed. So the blame is diffused in this way. And the Rothschilds also try and uh, position themselves as spearheading Jewish people. They created this kind of sub-religion within Judaism, like a, another offshoot of Judaism called Rothschild Zionism, basically. They created their own family religion. That's how powerful they are. And they've passed this down, you know, from person to person within the family. and the way I see it is it's basically a set of ideologies that are created to maintain the wealth. It's like a kind of ideological immune system for the Rothschild. So they can 
use these ideas to kind of bulwark their wealth against the masses who are going to try and take it from them, basically. And so they've kind of taken this religion and they call it Judaism and then they push it a lot and talk about, you know, and it's to the point, the impression I get is that they basically won't do business with anyone who doesn't hold the ideology of Rothschild Zionism to some degree. But let's talk about the word Zionism, I guess, too, because a lot of people mix Zionism and Judaism as if they were the same thing or um, even worse, they'll see Zionism as like some kind of racist dog whistle term for Jews, which it's not, although some people do use it that way, which goes back to muddying the waters again. But anyways, Zionism to me is uh, basically stripped down. It's the desire to own Mount Zion, which is what it's named after. Of course. So Mount Zion is the mountain in the middle of Jerusalem in Israel. So the way it is right now, if you look at a map, Israel has half of Jerusalem. It's split in half, like at the Wailing Wall, which is at the top of Mount Zion. And basically the Jewish people had control of Mount Zion where they had the Temple of Solomon and then it got destroyed. I think it was 1500 years ago. Right. And then it got replaced by the Dome on the Rock, which is built by Muslims and the Palestinians, basically. So the Israelites basically want control of Mount Zion, which means they want control of Jerusalem, and which means they want the Palestinians out. So um, this is what modern Zionism means. Historically, Zionism was more like, you know, the Jews need a place to stay that they can call their own. Sure. But now we've gotten to a point where there's two states and there's the borders have been drawn, but there's still kind of a encroaching going on. Israel's building all these settlements in the West Bank. Right just kind of eroding the Palestinian hold. And it's very clear that the ultimate desire is to retake Jerusalem for Israel. Right. Yeah, it is a, a tangled web, but it does seem like, obviously, on this show, we've talked about groups hiding within larger groups. I think it is a tactic that's used all the time. And obviously, this is the template for that. And I guess, is the theory that Hitler was actually helping the Rothschilds by perpetuating that idea that it's all Jews that are the problem? Were they in allegiance to some degree? You know, I I honestly haven't studied this particular thing enough to really be able to say one way or the other, but I would not be surprised if there was um, funding that was backing this situation. But the thing is, they don't want to, if, if the Rothschilds own a country, they don't want to destabilize that country. It's only when they lose control that they want to destabilize it so they can regain control, right? Right. So uh, and then a good way to control any revolution is to spearhead the opposition. So it seems likely to me that they were spearheading the opposition and then maybe it got out of control or went away they didn't expect or something like that. But from what I understand, they got run out of Germany, basically, and had to go to Austria. And uh, none of them were, you know, prosecuted for what they did. Right. <laughs> it's you know they just basically got away and then they just blamed the jews and then everyone focused on the jews and then that became the story <laughs> yeah it's it seems like a situation basically that got out of control for them they might have been pushing things one way or the other trying to spearhead the opposition but I, I do think it it seems like they went too far they they lost control of the situation because they they did get pretty much kicked out for a while and the, the situation obviously got pretty out of control fair enough and then there are maybe some critics to this narrative that say, well, the Rothschild interests basically were dismantled during that World War II period. But like you noted earlier, the head of the British branch is still a Rothschild. We still see their name around a lot. And does the paper trail suggest that they did reclaim some of their uh, banking power once World War II was over? Did the Allies give them back a lot of their assets? Yeah, well, it's it, it was clear Germany lost and then the the West won, basically. And so knowing that the, the UK branch was basically unbroken up till modern day, the amount of power that the UK had post-World War II over Germany shows that, you know, the Rothschild basically retook control of Germany after the war. Um, uh, it seems pretty clear from my perspective. Right on. Cool, man. So... That is a lot of great information. And now we wanted to talk about kind of 
the corporatocracy or how things have maybe flexed a little bit or evolved in modern times. And we see a lot of the same templates, but yet they're applied in a slightly different way. Is that what how you might describe it? Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. You know, this whole template of central banking came about, you know, in the early 1800s, basically. So it's been around for 200 years. So there's been, you know, a lot of people have observed what the Rothschilds have been doing. And people with a lot of power and money have started to play this game, too. So it's not as though the Rothschilds have a complete monopoly over everything. They just have a 150 year head start, basically. But yeah, so looking at more corporatocracies. Another country that's very interesting is the country of Chad. It's just to the west of Sudan. Most people know Chad is just a lot of military action there, a lot of fighting, and it's just not a very nice country. And that's that's maybe all people know. Mm -hmm. However, there is a very interesting story with Chad in regards to their exports. 96% of Chad's exports are crude petroleum. So this comes from oil extraction infrastructure in Chad that's owned 75% by Exxon and 25% by Chevron, which actually just sold their 25% stake to the Chadian government in 2014 for $1.3 billion. This loan was funded by another company, Glencore, who is the 14th largest company in the world, who funded Chad to buy chevron's piece basically hmm. so however exxon still owns 75 percent of the infrastructure right so basically two corporations fighting over the carcass that is the country of chad basically and then when chevron sold their 25 percent you know to give independence to chad to give control of that 25 percent of the chadian government that costs 1.3 billion dollars they don't have that money so they had to borrow it from glencore which then immediately puts them into debt. So they're, again, in heavy debt to a company. You know, So they're not any more independent than they were previously. Right. And especially looking at the terms of this loan, they're supposed to repay the $1.3 billion in four years. So it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. I mean, and then when they aren't able to do that, then Glencore can basically come, come along and you know, start negotiating terms about this money they can't pay back, which effectively gives them partial control over the government. So, you know, they can say, oh, what if we could drill in this national park or, you know, something like that? And it's like, well, you have to say yes, because you owe us $1.3 billion and it's due. So that's coming up. So that's due in 2018 for Chad. So they're scrambling right now. So actually, Chad just filed the largest lawsuit in world history. So Chad is right now suing Exxon for $74 billion, which is five times the GDP of the entire country. So they're trying to reclaim all this money that they think Exxon stole from them. And basically, in order to get money to pay off the Glencore bill so they can own their 25%. Right. So <laughs> this is all like been unfolding. November 2016 was when this lawsuit was announced. And they're still working on terms. Exxon's saying they're not going to pay because Exxon's profits are their profits are sixteen billion dollars a year. So if they were to pay the full seventy four billion, it would eat up all their profits for you know five years or something like that. So uh, they don't want to do that. So they would rather cease operations in Chad. But I don't think they're going to cease operations. I think they've worked out some sort of settlement with Chad to kind of kick the can down the road for a little more. Of course. But I think they're going to try and settle for lower than seventy four billion. Um, but I'm curious to see how flexible the Chad government is, the Chadian government. If they don't flex at all and just say $74 billion or get out of here, then Exxon might either be forced to turn over all their equipment to the Chadian government or more likely they would bring in troops to defend Exxon's interests and would basically put the Chadian government back into the box that they want them to be in. Absolutely. And that's what um, that book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, is all about, is being a part of the team that goes around and, and does that kind of stuff when these countries try to act like they have some kind of autonomy or something. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's just fascinating, this particular tug of war, because you have the government of Chad buying that 25% that wasn't owned by Exxon, and they're taking that loan from Glencore. And because they're taking that huge loan, now they're clearly 
on the puppet strings of Glencore. And then what do they do? They file this ridiculously large lawsuit against ExxonMobil. Well, no shit, because this is probably with a gun to their head through Glencore, because Glencore is trying to, they're basically fighting a, a, a tug of war with another multinational corporation, and they're just using Chad as a middleman. And it's just so interesting <laughs> to see that unfold. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. It's just Man. company versus company with these governmental facades in a lot of cases. <laughs> I love it, man. So, you know, as we maybe talk about this umbrella of company nations, as interesting as it is, have you seen any other examples of this besides Chad, Zimbabwe, and Botswana? Obviously, there's speculation, I mean, pretty well established speculation that even the United States of America and these major countries are at the behest of these same private bankers but have you seen other parallel examples to maybe smaller nations in the same way you've seen these three another example would be like iraq when we invaded iraq you know we destroyed the country basically and then after it was destroyed it needed to be rebuilt so there's all these building contractors that got very lucrative jobs in iraq so that was like the major industry in iraq for many years and in fact the largest u.s the largest embassy in the world is a u.s embassy in Iraq. It's over a million square feet. And they paid some outrageous sum for this building. And it's it's pseudo money laundering. Basically, they destroy the, the military industrial complex comes in and destroys the building. And then the contractors come in and rebuild the building. So both people are making money and then they can continue this cycle over and over again. And it's very profitable. Mm -hmm. So it's not only is it like Chad, we're talking about there's one company. It's like Exxon owns everything. You know, they have 96% of the ex said 75% of the 96% of the export market, which is a third of the entire economy of Chad. So that that's a lot of control for one company. But however, other countries, there's a more diversified form of control. So there might be like 10 companies, like a McDonald's, a Walmart, a housing contractor, whatever you've got. Each industry might have its own monopoly. And then once you've set the stage for those to come in, all those monopolies can come and take over their respective industries. So the media companies can come in and set up, you know, Zimbabwean media or Chadian media or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, they can set up McDonald's there in Chad. They can set up car dealerships. They can sell housing. They can start giving loans. They, you know, there's all this stuff that can start to take place once they've got their foot in the door. Yeah, man. I mean, you're laying it out very clearly, and I don't know how someone could argue with it. And sticking with the corporate takeover theme, we also wanted to talk about regulatory capture, which is something that I think we talk about often on the show, but the term is fairly new to me. Detail this for us and some proper examples, if you could. Yeah, sure. Regulatory capture is basically when the companies take over the regulation that is supposed to be watching them. It's a very advanced form of corporate takeover. So instead of the corporation just flat out running the government, they will instead take over the, the lobbying agencies. So if you're Monsanto, for example, you can take over the USDA or the FDA. And then if you have some questionable pesticides that you're using, then that might not mean approval otherwise. If you're in control of the regulatory agency, not only can you approve your chemical, but you can write laws that make it so your chemical is the only legal chemical and no one else can use any chemicals. So you've given yourself a legal monopoly by taking over the mechanism that is supposed to limit you from doing that. So by concentrating all this power in these regulatory agencies, they've just opened the door for these companies to kind of step in and regulate themselves, but with the pretense of the government's doing it and someone's watching and so on and so forth. Right. So the the amount of regulatory capture that has happened is pretty outlandish when you really, really look at it. For example, the VP of Pfizer uh, was on the National Security Council. The corporate council lobbyist for Pfizer uh, became legislative assistants to representatives. The VP of Global Public Policy for Merrick was the U.S. Trade Representative under Clinton. The senior VP for Public, public Policy for Pharmacia was the commissioner for the FDA. 
the CEO of PHRMA was the U.S. Treasury Department under Bush. The CEO of Pfizer was the uh, New York Federal Reserve Bank under Obama. I mean, these people are getting very, very high-level positions, and they call this the revolving door between regulation and industry. It's very lucrative if you're in industry to go into regulation or vice versa. Most developed countries make this illegal. Uh, You can't transition from one to the other uh, between industry and regulation, sometimes not at all, and sometimes with a delay of like five years. But in the U.S., it's just immediate. I mean, it's like the second you're done being a senator or a congressman in the U.S., you become a lobbyist. I mean, it's like they have jobs waiting for you. And that's part of the offer. You know, they'll buy you steak dinners. They'll buy the, they can't just give you money. So instead, they offer you this lobbying job, this extremely lucrative lobbying job. And this continues this revolving door of regulatory capture, basically. These seven uh, Venn diagrams you have on the subreddit, I'm not sure if you made them yourself or just shared them, but these seven Venn diagrams are very damning to anyone who would want to try to laugh about the conspiratorial perspective because you got Big Oil, Comcast, GE, Goldman Sachs, Media, Monsanto, and Big Pharma, and each one has a dozen cases of the revolving door. And It's just so well laid out. I'd recommend anybody take a look at it if you really want to get the details of that for your own personal arguments with people who just think this is uh, craziness. It's just really surprising to me how how blatant it is, man. Yeah. Also how ironclad and absolute it is. There is really no industry you can look at and say, well, they've yet to get that one. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's this has become like a model of operation that's just been copied from industry to industry over the last you know 150 years. So, I mean, we've gotten our, ourselves to a point now where it's pretty like there's not much wiggle room left. We're, we're really in a corporatocracy right now where the, the corporations are running not only the regulatory agencies, but a lot of the lobbying efforts. And, you know, it's it's like the banking, especially looking at Goldman Sachs, like the CEO of Goldman Sachs is John Corzine. He was a U.S. senator. So, I mean, we've just got the CEO being a senator, you know, and a different CEO, uh, Henry Paulson, was the Treasury Secretary under Bush. And, you know, right. Trump just nominated, I think, three or four different Goldman Sachs members to his cabinet. I mean, these people are in, they're in there. I mean, they've, they've got <laughs> they're this in thing. Deep. Like, they're at the highest levels doing the advising, doing the you know, bill proposing, doing, I mean, they are the senators, they are the lobbyists. I mean, it's extremely widespread and it's right in our faces. And I mean, you see it again and again with the policy that comes out. It's very pro-corporate policy, very anti-human, I mean, to really boil it down. Yeah. Amen, man. And the the military industrial complex is another part that needs to be spoken of specifically. Sure. Because, uh, you know, Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex in his departing speech. JFK warned about these secret societies months before he was assassinated. These entities need profit. These are business entities, right? If you own a company that makes tanks or guns or bombs, you, you need to sell those, right? And so you need to have a market. Yeah. In order to have a market, you have to have a war. Right. If there's no war, nobody's buying guns, really. So you've got to create a war. So if you've got like the Iraq war, for example, then you can sell all these Tomahawk missiles that, you know, 16 million a pop or whatever. You can sell all these jets. You can sell all this stuff. And if there wasn't a war, that stuff wouldn't be needed. So your industry wouldn't be as valuable. So there's a strong incentive by the military industrial complex to create wars that are publicly supported because that's how they can get the most income well said man and what's what's also very interesting is that they'll play both sides of this so they'll get two sides to fight each other right and then sell weapons to both sides so right now the the two largest arms exporters in the world are the united states and russia they're number one and two far and away so a lot of modern wars now we see that are proxy wars are essentially the Russian military industrial complex arming one side and then the U.S. military industrial complex arming the other side. And then those two sides fight and things get destroyed in the process. And then having to make those things again is profitable, be it houses or 
bullets right or airplanes and both nations profit greatly without really suffering any losses because those have been outsourced right exactly yeah <laughs> oh man can have the work done for dirt cheap and then <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's a pretty good business model when your product literally explodes and then you have to build a new one from scratch like that i mean Let's be honest, that's a pretty good business model. <laughs> right, right. It's the only way to do it, really. And so we also wanted to kind of round out the first hour here with kind of a little bit about solutions. And then, of course, in the second hour, we can go back through and get into deeper detail about some of these things. But to talk about solutions, basically, we were going to talk about social control mechanisms that kind of keep the status quo in place and then what we could do to overcome those. I mean, what are the biggest thorns in our side that you think would fall under this umbrella? Well, public education, for one, it's said that the victors write the history books. And so, uh, you know, U.S. history books have no mention of Rothschild, for example, despite the fact that they're so key to a lot of this. So they kind of paint themselves out of the picture. And then the media is doing the same thing. You know, there's five or six corporations that own 95% of U.S. media. And so that's five or six CEOs and boards that essentially control the messaging for 95% of media. So if they don't like a show, they can cancel it. If they want a different type of show, they can add it. You know, this is the media environment we have. It's movies, it's print media, it's, it's everything. So they control that messaging system. And like Common Core, for example, the U.S., education system seems much more about rote memorization than creative learning or actual thinking skills. But with those two, and then on top of it, there's all these other factors like debt slavery, for example, is probably the largest problem. Debt slavery being when you have to go to work because you have bills that are coming due. That's being trapped in debt slavery because you can't stop working. You can't stop paying the debt. So you're basically obligated to contribute to the economic machine they own and create value for them while making some paltry sum for yourself that then you're forced to pay into debt that is accruing interest all the time. That's very difficult to pay off. And especially with the student loan situation now, they've created the illusion that college is an absolute necessity for every single person. And so people will take out 50, 60, you know, $100,000 of loans Right. To pay this college. And then they basically got the size of a mortgage before they even own a house. And so, you know, it's no wonder we have all these people living at home now who can't pay their bills and stuff because they're already paying a mortgage and there's no jobs. A lot of people didn't get rewarded in the way they thought they would for going to college. So they've been trapped in these bad jobs that are worse than they expected, earning less than they expected to pay off this humongous sum that they just, you know, are having a lot of trouble actually reducing so that's kind of being trapped in a way and that's a kind of it's kind of a slavery really in a way the the old models of slavery actually in the 1860s when the civil war was fought slavery was actually going out of style not just for moral reasons but for economic reasons it actually become so expensive to own a slave that it was actually cheaper to hire someone to work for you Because when you hire someone, you don't have to pay for their housing. You don't have to pay for their food. You just give them money and they go home to their own place at the end of the day. So you don't have to support all these things. It's actually cheaper to have workers. So our economy transitioned from a slavery system to a worker-based system because it was cheaper. Absolutely. So taking a step back and looking at all the different ways that There's all these different types of control and all these different narratives and cultural norms and things that are trying to get passed that cause us to react certain ways when certain events happen. So if, for example, 9-11 led to the Iraq war, basically, but if people had been a little more observant about the context of it, then maybe people would have not been so gung-ho about invading Iraq, and maybe that war would not have happened. And the million Iraqis that died as a consequence of our invasion over the next 10 years would not have died. But So a lot of it is, I think, people need to be able to think for themselves, which they've basically been told their whole lives not to do, been punished for thinking for themselves in school a lot of times, and you know by having opinions that run counter to the media and things like this. So I think it's very important to 
reclaim your own mind and reclaim your own thoughts and to not be afraid of trying to fit into cultural norms that are often created top down anyways. They're not natural. Uh, they don't come from the culture itself as it appears. Mm -hmm. So other than the, the mindset, there's other things we can do on a more substantial level, like financially. Ideally, we could get away from the private central banking system and return the money creation abilities to the government so the government's not in debt all the time. Because if the government creates its own money, then it can't be in debt to itself. It wouldn't be a debt-based monetary system. If we could fix that, that would change things. But that's a very top-level change. <laughs> right. That's a tall order. So a more uh, graspable change would be, I think, owning the means of production is very important. Owning money creation ability is like owning means of production of the most valuable commodity. If you own any types of means of production, like any machine that can produce things creates value for you, I think if people start owning these types of machines and bringing businesses back to a level where they control it rather than it being this kind of hierarchical monarchy, basically, where the CEO, you know, owns everything and is God. If we transition away from this type of business system, I just find it funny that we've outlawed monarchy in our governments for, you know, several hundred years now, but it's still the de facto standard in all corporations. <laughs> I just, I find that hilarious. And I think we, we need to definitely move into more democratically owned workplaces where, you know, the shares of the company stock are owned by the workers, the machinery and equipment are owned by the workers, and the profits are distributed amongst everyone who works in the company rather than just being collectivized all at the top. So I think if we focus on regaining tools that make us money, the means of production, and then focus on a long-term goal of getting rid of this private central bank that loans add interest to our government, and then we take the tack of thinking about the world from a clear perspective instead of trying to fit into top-down cultural norms. I think if those three things are taken very seriously by enough people, then change would come. Man, well said. And I think that is a pretty good capstone on the first hour here. I did want to throw this out as well to quote your piece, Booping the Zeitgeist, which I love. A uh, great term, great title. <laughs> Thank you. One of my favorite scenes from Superbad, of course, uh, is the, the infamous boop. But you say, I think much of the divisiveness and polarization we've seen come about in American society this last decade is due to this cultural ego crisis brought on by a failing economy. Ultimately, it's hard to lie to yourself about the superiority of your culture when you're in destitution. So a lot of people are coming to sober realizations about how screwed we are, which creates an anger that the media skillfully redirects onto scapegoats so the truly powerful aren't even talked about. This is how I'm afraid it'll go down, but the silver lining is the more people that are aware of this possibility, the less likely it becomes. And I do think that is a great breakdown of where a lot of people's mental space is right now, because when you're propagandized so heavily, especially here, that you're the best nation on earth, and then you're confronted with this economy that is maybe on its last legs, it is tough. I mean, it definitely causes some turmoil in the minds of people, and we have all this outrage, and you're right, it's misdirected. It's blacks versus whites, it's men versus women, it's alt-right versus postmodernist liberals. And really, we should focus on exactly what our problems are and how to have a better life for all of us, which really has nothing to do with the legislation of these other groups or putting them down or whatever. We could find common things that we all need, which is to be debt-free, to have a better education system, just to have a better structure for everyone, if we could just focus, you know, if we could avoid these pitfalls and focus. Right. Yeah, that's exactly true. Right on. So you have just written about so many awesome things, man. And this really has been a blast. <laughs> uh, it really was this Rothschild's own Zimbabwe and Botswana post that impressed me most. And then, of course, the Exxon Mobil owning Chad saga. I don't think it surprises a lot of people in the audience, but I think they're, they are interesting chapters to the story that have really yet to be 
laid out. So big thanks for that. And I am curious if you plan to do anything in this field beyond your Reddit post. Do you plan to write a book or somehow take your work in this area up a notch or two? Uh, I'm probably going to be starting a blog soon to get things off of Reddit. And then uh, I'll probably be starting a Patreon or something along those lines in the near future. So uh, I'm looking to expand my writing more, perhaps as a kind of freelancing thing. If I can uh, get enough funding, I could do it as a full-time job. I would love yeah. to do that. But yeah, hopefully I'm contributing more time writing to it, more articles. And uh, I'm able to make about one or two a week right now. And, you know, I'd love to do an article on like every country and explain who owns it and then put all those together and have kind of a narrative of how the world works. I think that would be amazing. Oh, hell yeah, man. That book does not exist yet. You could definitely put it in a, you know, one big tome about basically the uh, encyclopedia of countries and their ownership. That would be ambitious, but it'd be pretty damn awesome, man. And you really are on that track already. So yep. I would just say you have a gift and I'm actually really psyched to be able to direct the audience to your subreddit because they're going to learn some stuff and i guess uh that's it I, I like your style man i like your moves remind the people where they can read that stuff if they do want to dig deeper after this conversation well if you want to look at more writings you can go to the magnora 7 subreddit which is you can just google magnora 7 or you can go to reddit.com slash r slash magnora 7 boom awesome man well thanks again keep doing what you do and best of luck out there Thank you, Greg. Really enjoyed the interview. You got it. Wow. Magnora 7. <laughs> I'm happy. I love this one. We got a little back to basics, but with a twist. I was actually going to put something about African ownership in the title because that's the most unique thing about this one. But it's not just Africa. It's like fucking everything. And Magnora 7 has a real unique research path. I hope he does make the global encyclopedia of ownership. I would love to see that book. And nobody take his idea. Of course, I don't really know his real name, so I wouldn't be able to call you out on it anyway, but that would not be cool. Still, I mean, it's just so interesting. Also funny that in a synchronistic fashion, wedding and engagement type of things keep popping up in the shows lately. Definitely with Connor Habib. And I also feel like something was said with Matt Landman, but I can't really remember what it was. Stephen Strong mentioned marriage and not talking to your mother-in-law in the Australian originals culture. And today we talked about the De Beers engagement ring tradition scam. But it's all in good fun. I'm really happy to be getting married. And that's really why I got to get out of here. I got friends showing up in less than 10 hours at this point. Half the state of Missouri <laughs> coming out to celebrate. But I am glad we got three shows out so early this month. Boom. And I do like all of them. And so there will be two more episodes coming out the last week of the month when my special lady and I get back from Tulum, Mexico, where we are going to swim with dolphins, people. <laughs> I've been wanting to do that for a long, long time. And she wanted to take a honeymoon. And I thought this was a good compromise between not going very far and knocking a major thing off my freaking bucket list. Maybe they'll help me catch some fish like they do in Australia, right? But back to business, of course, there's a plus show today. What did I talk to Magnora7 about in the extended show? Well, we got into the Rothschilds' investments and level of control in Russia and China, the banking puppet masters in the Trump administration, the pitfalls of identity politics, Kabuki Theater, the Vatican's role in their loans from the Rothschilds, J.P. Morgan and his role in the big conspiracy, the American police brutality problem, the viral Dutch banker whistleblower interview of Ronald Bernard, dominance hierarchies and Jordan Peterson, and of course, most importantly, why the Fat Tire Brewing Company is so awesome. So guys, I know you like this show, you've been listening for a while, please consider joining up for Plus. I've got all the server issues finally worked out, it was an expensive mess, but we're good to go. And you're going to have a two-week gap coming up, so why not go back and listen to the second hour of some of your favorites from the archives. There's great ones in there. Gordon White, Chris Knowles, Peter Lavenda, Nick Redfern, Laird Scranton, Donald Marshall. I mean, what do you want? What do you need? You would also get into some of the extra stuff, download the THC music, hear my Science of Consciousness conference breakdown, watch a little of me and Graham Hancock in Armenia. I'm trying here. 
throw a guy a bone or five. But either way, I'm out of commission for the next two weeks. I love you guys. Thanks for all the support and for listening. And I'm going to catch you on the flip side. Again, thanks to Magnora7 today. I think he did a great job. I've done what I can. Your move, Rothschild Wreckers of Everything Right, Debt Barons of the Capstone, and Corporatocracy Cohorts. Your fucking move. Have a drink and a smoke. Listen to the cast. We shine a shiny spotlight. Put criminals on blast. The pinstripe men of mourning. And families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. We're looking for the answer to questions never asked. So we come to the Cartwood for the higher side chats. The pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance. DuPont, Windsor, and Rothschild. The kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't. The kids don't stand. The kids don't stand a chance. shady business we try to get a glance we're working on the numbers resistance must advance the pinstripe men of mourning and families of finance dupont windsor and rothschild the kids don't stand a chance the kids don't the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. The kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. I said the kids don't, the kids don't stand, the kids don't stand a chance. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. 
I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too. I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ Help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or 